thing for all the science agencies that uh, you know help us in the states like Sea Grant. Yeah, that was yeah. going to be a drag. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay guys, and uh, it's nine o'clock. We had to start with uh, such a great joy this morning with the great news <laughs> five minutes ago. And uh, I think, uh, you know, this is a reward, Dave, for you, Dave, and uh, for your all hard work. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, good morning and good, for America, good morning, America. And uh, good morning, good afternoon for our European colleagues and good evening for our Asian colleagues, Chinese colleagues. And uh, so welcome again to this world, uh, River and the Delta System Source to Sync webinar series. And uh, today we get Professor Dave DeMoss to talk about uh, radio chemistry and uh, the uh, major Delta system all the way from Amdong, Yangtze and the Mekong. And uh, so uh, next week, uh, we have two more talks. Uh, one from uh, University of Cambridge, uh, Yachus. He will talk about uh, the melting suspended sediment and the carbon transport uh, in the Ladu River system and focused on the Irrawaddy and the Solomon River. And uh, so we try to quanti quantify, you know, how much of the sediment and carbon coming down from the source. And also Sam Bentley from Louisiana State University he will tell a story about the Mississippi, Mississippi River source to sink a system. And so Dave, so Dave, uh, we, he grew up from uh, 200 meters from the Lake of Michigan. And uh, uh, then he went to the University of uh, uh, Wisconsin. Is it Madison or? Yes, Madison. Yeah. Then he went to the Yale University. Uh, and you can see this young guy is the back to the PhD research cruise, I guess, in Gulf of California. And uh, after that, in uh, uh, end of 1970s, he moved to the North Carolina State University to become a member of the Wolfpack. And he stayed here, oh gosh, it's uh, more than 40, 40 years, almost 43, 42. And so great. Yeah, uh, 42 at this point. Yeah, make the wolf more stronger, the wolf, make the wolf pack. As you can see, and in 19, early 1980s, he went to China and at the first group to study the, uh, the East China Sea and the Yellow Sea. As you see here, this is in Qingdao, and this is the young guy that's graduate student, I think in the, in the audience, Clark. And- Yeah, uh, that's Clark. Yeah, and as you can see, uh, Chuck and uh, they in 1983 after the cruise in the South Yellow Sea and uh, so they have a pretty happy time over there with the Professor Chin and Dave later on also uh, resumed his uh, research in the high latitude Antarctic because his PhD dissertation also studied a little bit globally uh, high latitude and low latitude and uh, most recently uh, Dave and I, we went to uh, uh, Vietnam. We studied the Mekong River Delta in the South China Sea and the Red River Delta uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin. And so uh, um, I think Dave is a great uh, scholar, is, uh, is, uh, is my mentor and is a great friend. French, we have the great friend, is a very nice guy. As you can see here, this is a snapshot of his Google Scholar citation, as you can see. It's uh, almost uh, 15,000 citation. It's a very achievement, particularly the earlier work about uh, silica, as we just uh, talked about. And uh, maybe we'll get him to talk about silica in next semester. And uh, so I think uh, I, 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 will, I will stop here, Dave. So now I'll give to you. You can begin to share. I can do that. All right, well, thanks, Paul, for the introduction. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, uh, I, I hope that by the end of the talk, you'll appreciate uh, a few things that uh, radio chemistry can offer with regard to understanding flow dynamics and sedimentary processes in uh, major deltaic systems. So what I thought I'd do today would be to provide a few pearls of wisdom 
pearls of radiochemical wisdom uh, from the late 20th century. Um, and uh, uh, these pearls of wisdom might be new to some of the uh, newer students in the audience. Uh, and then some of the older researchers may have forgotten them. So uh, I'm gonna provide some pearls of wisdom uh, from the late uh, 20th century, but then update it with uh, some comparisons to our more recent work that Paul and I have been doing on the Mekong. And so uh, I'm gonna stick with just kind of the radiochemistry, not all the geochemistry uh, of these major dispersal systems and uh, just give you an insight of what radio nuclides can do for helping us to understand the dynamics of uh, major dispersal systems. So in today's talk, I'm going to first, as you see up here, uh, I'm gonna use lead 210 inventories to assess flow dynamics in the Amazon. That was work back in the uh, 1980s and 1990s, but then we'll compare it to the Mekong, uh, which is uh, uh, work done in the last uh, five years. So um, uh, that'll be an interesting comparison. Uh, secondly, we're going to look at radionuclides as uh, they help us understand uh, sediment dynamics in deltaic systems, mainly sediment accumulation is the uh, parameter of interest, and we'll use tracers like lead-210, cesium-137, and carbon-14. So the uh, determination of rates of sediment accumulation was broken into three parts. First, there is the uh, efficacy of using lead-210 and cesium-137 in ma major deltaic environments. I'll cite work from the Changjiang Yangtze shelf. Um, secondly, uh, then we'll look at radiochemical approaches in non-deltaic systems. Uh, and I'll cite some work from the Antarctic where we used lead-210 and carbon-14 together to establish sediment accumulation rates with much better results than the cesium and lead-210 from the uh, Changjiang shelf. And then lastly, uh, uh, we'll look at the usefulness of lead-210 and carbon-14 in major deltaic systems. Um, and you'll see why that becomes relevant. Most radiochemists believe that carbon-14 is the tracer of choice because it has a longer half-life and isn't subject to the effects of bioturbation. And we'll see in this uh, study on the Mekong that uh, lead-210 is actually the more robust uh, tracer uh, because it has a uh, more steady state. Uh, it doesn't violate the steady state assumptions uh, on, on the shelf. And then lastly, I'll close with uh, uh, a uh, examination of sedimentary processes on different timescales, can contrast 100 day timescale with thorium-234 uh, with a 100 year time scale uh, using lead 210. So uh, uh, that is our, from an early study in the 1980s. Again, uh, some of you may not have heard of it. Some of you have forgotten it. It's worth reminding. So I'm, these are my pearls of wisdom that uh, I'm offering to, uh, uh, to the uh, sediment logical group studying major deltaic systems. All right, so let's get started. Who are our major actors and actresses to try, try and be inclusive? Uh, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, tracers like thorium-234, beryllium-7, lead-210, carbon-14, cesium-137. Uh, the top four of these are all naturally occurring tracers. Carbon-14 has a little bit of bomb associated with it, bomb produced carbon with it, but uh, uh, the only uh, non-steady state or uh, unnatural tracer is cesium-137, and that's produced by nuclear bombs. Uh, cesium has a 30-year half-life and uh, mainly came from nu stratospheric nuclear bomb testing that was starting in the uh, 19, or late 1950s and peaking in the early 1960s. So uh, to put this in perspective, you know, uh, old geezers like uh, Chuck Nittrauer and myself, and even some of our students like Steve and Clark, uh, cesium-137 was kind of a given 
Well, if you notice its half-life of 30 years and its impulse was like 1960 or 1965, uh, a tracer was only effective for about five half-lives. So by the time some of the students that are watching this today retire, there's not going to be any bomb produced cesium-137 left in the deltas. So uh, I thought I'd put that in perspective and compare the timing of the impulse tracer with the uh, uh, half-life of the tracer. The others are all naturally produced, and that's not a consideration. They will go on for uh, uh, long, long periods of time. Okay, a lot of these tracers like thorium and beryllium and lead are what we call particle reactive. That means when they're produced, they don't want to be soluble in seawater and they are adsorbed onto the nearest particles and they settle to the seabed uh, where they can be used to trace uh, particle dynamics, sediment accumulation, bioturbation uh, in the seabed. Carbon-14 isn't uh, particle reactive, but it is uh, incorporated into the organic matter produced on land and in the marine environment, as well as incorporated into inorganic carbon, calcium carbonate uh, in carbonate shells. So, and cesium-137 is uh, particle reactive, adsorbs onto particles, and again, is a tracer of, impulse tracer of, uh, uh, particles that have uh, settled uh, since about the 1960s. All righty. So back in the uh, uh, 1980s, we had our first Amazon shelf uh, cruises. And uh, we, we looked, this is a cross section of the Amazon clinoform. And uh, you can see here that uh, this is specific activity. That just means DPM per gram. And you can see here that the specific activity of lead 210 increases uh, as we go offshore. It goes from 1.2 to all the way up to 9.1. And uh, uh, so we notice that there's very likely a offshore source to, that's responsible for this increase and specific activity in the offshore direction. We, in that early 1980s study, we didn't uh, integrate all the, we didn't have enough cores to integrate the shelf, but uh, uh, we were, we would do that later on the Amazon shelf uh, as part of a project called Amaseds, which many of you have heard of uh, in past talks. So this is where we got the idea that offshore waters were gonna be a significant source of lead 210 to the Amazon shelf. And we're gonna use that source of lead 210 to quantify the amount of water moving up onto the shelf as a result of uh, river ocean circulation, estuarine circulation uh, on the Amazon. Of course, you all know that the Amazon supplies about 20% of the world's uh, riverine, freshwater riverine flux to the ocean and is the largest of the rivers. So if we're gonna see kind of an entrainment source of lead 210, the Amazon is probably the uh, dispersal system that has the greatest potential for bringing in offshore lead 210. So the way we're gonna solve for this uh, 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 offshore flux of water is to uh, do a mass balance for lead 210 on the uh, Amazon shelf. And so we're, we're going to look at how much lead 210 is in the sediments on this clinoform, uh, Amazon clinoform deposit. That'll be kind of the sink. And then we're gonna balance that against the various sources of lead 210. And the sources of lead 210 to the Amazon shelf are particles coming down the river. They can carry excess lead 210. And then one additional process that can happen, as uh, I showed earlier, uh, the effective parent of lead 210 is radium 226. And when particles carrying radium 226, the parent of lead 210, hit the high ionic strength, high salinity waters of the ocean, 
the radium-226 desorbs. That it means it comes off of the particles. And that creates ex more excess lead-210 on the particles because uh, the lead-210 does not desorb, only the parent radium-226 desorbs. So we can measure the suspended sediment coming down the river, it's excess lead-210 activity, but then we correct it for desorption to get the uh, net flux of lead-210 uh, to the Amazon system as a whole. In addition to riverine particles and desorption, we have an atmospheric supply. Uh, continental rocks contain lots of uranium and then radon, and radon's an inert gas, and it escapes to the atmosphere and decays to uh, polonium-210 and lead-210, and that falls from the sky in rain and dry deposition and can be an important factor or important supply of lead-210 to the uh, uh, shelf waters. And so I'll show you how we quantify that. And uh, there's also a very minor amount of in situ production from dissolved radium-226 uh, in shelf waters, we can correct for that. And so the idea is, is to, here's the sink on sediment accumulation, balance that against the sources of lead 210, riverine particles, atmospheric supply, in situ production. And then finally, by difference, we're gonna solve for the amount of onshore flow that's gonna be carrying lead 210 uh, up onto the shelf as a result of estuarine circulation. So here we go with the lead 210 uh, story and the budget for the shelf in the hope that we can calculate this offshore flow. And I'll, I'll tell you the take home message, we're gonna see that 10 times the flow of the Amazon. The Amazon is the 20, accounts for 20% of all the fresh water entering the ocean, the world's largest river. Well, the offshore flow that's entrained as a part of this estuarine circulation, as we'll see based on the lead 210 data, that offshore flow, offshore onshore flow is 10 times greater than the riverine freshwater discharge. So it's an enormous flux and uh, the radiochemistry is a, a good way to uh, quantify that, that number. So here we go. One thing you need to know, uh, you'll see me calculate lead 210 inventories. And what we're actually going to do to establish the uh, onshore flow is to compare lead 210 fluxes. So F here is flux, I is inventory. They are directly proportional by this constant lambda. And lambda is just the uh, radioactive decay constant, in this case for lead 210, which is the log of two divided by lead 210's half life, which is 22 years. So this lambda value for lead 210 in reciprocal years is 0 0.0311. So you can keep that in mind, but I may, mainly for you non-radiochemists, I wanted to have you know how we go from inventory, I, which is what the direct measurement that we make is made, uh, how we get from I to uh, uh, flux. And it's just by multiplying at steady state, we multiply by the, uh, uh, lead 210 decay constant. So here are the cores. This is from the Amoseds days. So now we've moved up to the 1990s and we have enough data to quantify the amount of uh, uh, lead 210 in the sediments on the Amazon clinoform. Uh, uh, this was a time when uh, Chuck and I were putting together uh, sediment dynamics on the Amazon shelf and uh, Robin Pope was working with us, making a lot of these lead 210 measurements as well as Donnie Smoke. And uh, so we had about 50 cores uh, from the Amazon shelf and we would measure the excess lead 210 profile. You integrate that with depth. And uh, when you integrate a lead 210 profile with depth, you get a inventory which has units of DPM per centimeter squared. So all of these inventories on the Amazon shelf have inventory have units of DPM per centimeter squared. And then of course you integrate that over the uh, area of the Amazon shelf 
And uh, when you integrate it over that area, you get a total inventory for the Amazon shelf that you can see here is 2.7 times 10 to the 17th DPM. So it's not DPM per centimeter squared anymore, it's just DPM. And then we can take that inventory and convert it into a flux, as I just mentioned, by uh, multiplying it by uh, the lead 210 decay constant 0 0.0311. So that's how we get the sediment flux into the seabed. It's a steady state. We presume it's a steady state flux. And uh, we take that 2.7 times 10 to the 17th, and we multiply it by this uh, decay constant, and we get a value of 8.4 times 10 to the 15th DPM per year as the burial flux of lead 210 uh, into the Amazon uh, shelf sediments. So that's the removal term. What we need to do now then is to calculate the supply terms such that by difference, we can uh, get this uh, uh, onshore flow of lead 210. So we need to quantify the atmospheric flux of uh, lead 210. We need to quantify this riverine particle flux and uh, uh, we need to quantify in situ production. This sediment flux is what we just quantified uh, in the previous slide. So then by difference again, we'll calculate this onshore flow. So here we go. I'm not going to provide uh, excruciating detail, but uh, I'll give you an overview of the overall approach. So for the atmospheric uh, supply of lead 210, the best way to quantify that uh, is to measure lead 210, excess lead 210, in a undisturbed soil profile uh, from your study area. <clears throat> Organic rich topsoil scavenge all the lead 210 falling from the atmosphere, and uh, they create a profile, as you see here in the uh, uh, right corner of your screen, and you can integrate this uh, lead 210 profile with depth, and get an inventory for that profile. You see here we have 10.5 DPM per centimeter squared. And then we can multiply that uh, inventory, the excess lead 210 inventory in the 100 year undisturbed soil profile by the lead 210 decay constant and get a lead 210 flux. Uh, in this case, 0.33 times 10 to the uh, 0.33 DPM per centimeter squared per year, which we multiply by the area of the Amazon shelf to get the Amazon supply. So uh, that's how we do the Amazon, uh, the atmospheric flux to the Amazon shelf. It's based on soil profile data. You may ask, why do I say the soil has to be undisturbed for 100 years? Well, again, the characteristic time scale for a radioactive tracer is five half-lives. So the half-life of lead 210 is about 22 years. So the characteristic time scale is about 110 years, five times 22. And so if you have an undisturbed uh, soil for about 100 years, you'll have a complete excess lead 210 profile. And uh, that's what we measured. And that's how we got the atmospheric flux. Uh, the riverine particulate study, uh, was again done uh, as part of AMASEDS. Donnie Smoke uh, took the lead on uh, most of this. He calculated that uh, after absorption, that the suspended particles coming down the uh, Amazon River uh, had about 1.55 dpm per gram on them. And uh, thus, when you multiply it by the billion tons of uh, sediment coming down the river per year, you can calculate a uh, lead 210 flux as a result of uh, uh, particulate, riverine particulate supply. <clears throat> and uh, that is shown here as 1.6 times 10 to the 15th DPM per year if all of the sediment from the Amazon uh, River accumulates on the shelf. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then the last source of lead 210 is in situ production and from dissolved radium 226 in Amazon shelf waters. And uh, that is uh, easily determined from the radium 226 content of shelf waters that 
Billy Moore measured directly, um, but it's about 0.1 DPM per liter for radium-226. Uh, that's also the uh, amount of dissolved lead-210 that's gonna be brought up onto the shelf. Uh, we'll see that in just a bit, but when you integrate that over the volume of water on the Amazon shelf, you find out that uh, dissolved radium-226 on the shelf can provide about 0 0.02 times 10 to the 15th DPM per year. So quite small compared to the particulate flux and the uh, uh, atmospheric flux. So putting all this together, we have the budget and uh, uh, these are the sources of lead 210 up here that I just described. Here is the sink for lead 210. And uh, uh, what we see is that uh, we have a, the, the sources that we can quantify total to about 1.3 times 10 to the 15th DPM per year. The atmospheric flux was 0.5 times 10 to the 15th. The uh, net riverine flux was 0.8 times 10 to the 15th. Now this, this is 0.8. You may have uh, noticed that I use, instead of using 1.6 times 10 to the 15th, uh, I use 0.8 times 10 to the 15th, half the amount. And that's because uh, I'm assuming that only half of the sediment coming down the Amazon River actually accumulates on the shelf per se. And so uh, that, that of course is from uh, Steve Keel's work uh, in the 1990s. Um, and uh, so that's why I'm using 0 0.8 times 10 to the 15th instead of 1.6. If we use uh, 1.6, it really doesn't change the story very much. Anyway, these add to 1.3, and uh, the sink that we uh, talked about, the lead 210 flux to the seabed is 8.4. So by difference, we get that offshore waters must be supplying 7.1 times 10 to the 15th uh, DPM per year. Now, as I just said, the lead 210 content of that offshore water maximum is 0 0.1 DPM per year, DPM uh, per liter. And so you can divide this uh, DPM per year value by 0 0.1 DPM per liter and get uh, liters per year that must flow up onto the Amazon shelf. And this is actually a minimum because uh, some of that lead 210 may have been stripped from the waters offshore. So anyway, when you do that, you find out that the flux of uh, uh, water up onto the shelf uh, is on the order of seven times 10 to the 16th uh, DPM, uh, uh, I'm sorry, seven times 10 to the 16th liters per year. And that is on the order of 10 times greater than the current water discharge from the Amazon River which is like six to uh, seven times 10 to the 15th uh, liters per year. And so that's where we get this ratio of onshore flow to riverine discharge to be on the order of 10 for the Amazon. That's a, a huge number. And it, uh, when I first saw it, I had, can this possibly be true? But you can also do a salt balance. Bob Beardsley and Dick Leinberger did a salt balance for the Amazon shelf as part of their physical oceanographic studies. And they found out a very similar number, 10 times the flow onshore must uh, occur in order to get a salt balance in addition to that much flowing onshore to give you a lead to 10 balance. So we're pretty confident on that, uh, those data for onshore flow in the case of the Amazon. All right, now we're gonna compare that same approach with the Mekong. And the Mekong's certainly a, a major dispersal system. And uh, Paul Liu and I were uh, there in uh, 2014 and 2015 and collected a, a number of casting cores. And uh, we, and then Chuck Nittrauer and I were there later on and with Paul and uh, uh, we amassed this, these data uh, and uh, we measured the inventories of lead 210 in just the proximal deposits 
near the uh, uh, Mekong uh, River mouth. So that, those are these data. These data are again in dpm per centimeter squared. Uh, but when you integrate it over the area of the shelf, uh, you get a inventory of 3.9 times 10 to the 15th dpm. Uh, so this, this study is, uh, was published in 2017. Uh, myself and Paul, uh, Emily Item, Chuck, and uh, TT Nguyen. Uh, from Vietnam. So these are the inventories and let's compare that with the Amazon story and we'll see that things are quite different on the Mekong as compared to the Amazon. So here's that comparison, Amazon and Mekong. And uh, first of all, you note here that the Mekong has uh, on the order of 70 times less lead to 10 on the uh, deltaic deposits as compared to the Amazon. The Amazon has 70 times more <laughs> lead to 10 uh, in it than does the Mekong. So that's, a, that's an initial observation. Uh, we're comparing just the proximal deposits on the Mekong uh, to those on the Amazon, but it's a 70 to one ratio. If you take just this amount of uh, lead to 10 that we observe in the Mekong Delta and say all of it is due to onshore flow, you can determine that uh, a maximum of two times 10 to the 14th liters, uh, I'm sorry, let's, let's start this again. Uh, if you take this 1.2 times 10 to the 14th uh, and divide it by the 0.1 DPM per liter, you find out that uh, you have on the order of two times the riverine flow uh, needed for offshore water to come onshore in order to sustain all of this lead to 10 uh, that we observe on the Amazon shelf, Amazon, on the Mekong shelf. I'll get it, stay with me. Uh, again, this Mekong inventory uh, if, it, if that's the only source of lead 210 to the shelf, it requires something on the order of two times the water discharge uh, coming down the Mekong. So it's something on the order of one or 10 times 10 to the 14th liters per year to uh, uh, support this inventory or this flux on the, the Mekong Delta. Now, if we look in more detail on the Mekong shelf, uh, we can estimate from models, how we didn't measure a soil profile, well from models we can uh, determine what the atmospheric flux is to the Mekong shelf, again using that same proximal area for the Mekong shelf, and it turns out to be that the atmospheric supply is about 1 times 10 to the 14th. Now remember that the seabed, the flux necessary to support the, at the atmospheric flux is 1 times 10 to the 14th dpm per year, the seabed requires a flux of just 1.2. So almost all of the uh, lead to 10 inventory on the Mekong shelf can come from atmospheric supply. You barely need any lead to 10 to come from offshore <clears throat> in order to, uh, uh, in order to uh, sustain the lead to 10 inventory observed on the, the Mekong shelf. So that's a huge distinction from the Amazon. In the Amazon, you've got like 85% of the lead 210 has to come from offshore. And uh, in the case of the Mekong, it's like zero to 20% at most. And uh, so if we do this, if we take the atmospheric uh, flux that we get from the modeling, we assume there's no excess lead 210 coming down uh, the river, which is uh, an underestimate, certainly. But if we do that, uh, we can find that uh, at most we have 0.2. Where's my? There it is. Come, come back. 0. Point, less than 0. 0.2 times 10 to the 14th dpm per year. And when you use the 0. 0.1 dpm per liter, led to 10 supply from offshore we get that the flux 
of water coming from offshore has to be less than two times 10 to the 14th. And that is only 40% of what the uh, actual freshwater flow is down the Mekong. So on the case of the case of the Amazon, we have uh, 10 times the flow coming up onto the shelf as a result of estuarine circulation. And on the case of the Mekong, we don't have to have any. And uh, it's certainly less than uh, the onshore flow to river water flow is less than 0.4. So a uh, huge difference between the situation on the Mekong uh, and the Amazon. And a lot of that is attributed to the enormous flow out of the Amazon. Remember that uh, the water discharge on the Amazon is uh, uh, an order of magnitude greater than that on the Mekong. Okay, so that's uh, the comparison of the Amazon uh, and the Mekong. Um, a lot of this difference is because the sediment inventory on the Mekong is so much less than it is on the Amazon. Um, and the, uh, the radionuclide uh, uh, inventory is you know, a factor of 70 less, but the flow is much less. You know, the flow is onto the Mekong shelf. If you compare them in absolutes, uh, it's like 350 more, 350 times more water coming up onto the Amazon shelf then comes up onto the Mekong shelf. And that's probably a minimum because uh, this 0.2 is uh, less than 0.2 times 10 to the 14th uh, DPM per year or less than two times 10 to the 14th liters per year. So a uh, big difference between the Amazon and the Mekong. And that was kind of a, an interesting comparison based on those radiochemical data. Tells us a little bit about how the, uh, dispersal systems and estuarine circulation are occurring based on these radionuclide uh, budgets. Okay, I'm gonna change gears now and uh, take some of the uh, more elderly researchers back to their graduate school days where we uh, uh, discussed uh, determining sediment accumulation rates and bioturbation intensities from radiochemical profiles. And so radiochemists have been uh, doing this type of approach for 60 years. Ed Goldberg was the first one to use this adv advection diffusion equation uh, to model the distribution of radionuclides in the seabed. And what we do is we use this uh, one dimensional advection diffusion model uh, to describe the distribution of a radionuclide in the seabed. And this DB is a bioturbation term. Uh, bioturbation is presumed to be diffusive, an infinite number of small random steps. Uh, in contrast to the diffusive term, bioturbation, we have an advective term, and that's our sediment accumulation rate term. And then also in this equation, you have production from the parent, uh, radium-226, and then you have decay of uh, the daughter in this case, uh, we'll be mainly looking at lead 210. Uh, in general, what we do as radiochemists is to combine these two terms and uh, subtract production from the total uh, decay. And so we calculate a thing called excess activity right here, excess activity, which is equal to the daughter activity, A2, minus that of the uh, parent activity, A1. And that's called excess, and that's where this little star comes from. This is the excess activity of the daughter, in this case, led to 10. And uh, the final equation is shown here. We presume steady state, so da2 da dt is equal to zero. And we're left with this equation, which of course, we have two unknowns. db is unknown, the bioturbation intensity, and s is unknown. So we'll need at least two tracers in order to uh, uniquely resolve this system. Of course, we do know the decay constant for lead 210, as we mentioned earlier uh, in the, uh, the talk this morning. 
All right, so that's our general approach, one-dimensional advection diffusion equation. Sorry for the review for some of you. Uh, uh, hopefully this is new to uh, at least a few of the younger graduate students. So this is that equation again, uh, steady state. At steady state, the solution to this one-dimensional advection diffusion equation is shown here. Uh, the sediment accumulation rate is equal to the lead 210 uh, the log of the lead 210 profile, essentially, uh, and then you subtract a bioturbation term. So if bioturbation is zero, like uh, it is when the bottom waters are anoxic, then this latter term can be uh, ignored. It can go to zero, and you can solve for the uh, sediment accumulation rate directly from the radiochemical profile, in this case, lead 210. However, if you have oxic bottom waters like you do in most continental shelf environments, then DB, uh, this bioturbation effect can be very important uh, in determining the an accurate uh, sediment accumulation, sediment accumulation rate. And we'll get into that in just a second. So as I mentioned earlier, it takes two tracers to resolve this uh, one dimensional uh, advection diffusion model for portraying radionuclide distributions in continental shelf sediments. Um, the first tracers that were used was lead 210, uh, a naturally occurring steady state tracer. But then to get comparable time scales, people used the bond produced tracer cesium-137, which adsorbs onto particles and uh, can be measured in uh, continental shelf sediments. So for an impulse tracer, uh, this equation doesn't hold. This is for naturally occurring tracers. For an impulse tracer, you look at the depth of penetration of that impulse tracer into the seabed, and it is equal to a diffusive term, in this case, 2 dBt, take the square root of that, and then that is plus an advective term. S is the sediment accumulation rate, and in this case, capital T is the time elapsed since the impulse tracer was introduced to the marine environment. In the case of uh, lead 210, uh, lead 210, the case of cesium 137, that was uh, uh, started in about 1960 or so. So the first attempts at using two radionuclides to resolve uh, bioturbation and sediment accumulation uh, used lead 210 and cesium 137. And so uh, back in the early 80s, Paul alluded to this in the introduction, uh, Chuck Nitrauer and I worked together on the uh, East China Sea accumulation uh, on the Changjiang, and later we worked with Clark Alexander on the Yellow River and uh, the Wang Ho. And, uh, uh, but I'm just going to cite this one core, an offshore mud deposit offshore of the Yangtze, and uh, we're going to look at the lead 210 and cesium 137 to see how useful cesium and lead are in most continental shelf environments. So uh, this is the core up here that we're going to be looking at. Uh, it has an apparent lead 210 accumulation rate of 0 0.29 uh, centimeters per year. So the data uh, show. Uh, are shown here. The lead 210 data have a rapidly mixed surface layer and then an exponential decay. The, if the, all of this is due to accumulation, no bioturbation, uh, then the accumulation rate is 0.29. As I mentioned, that's called an apparent lead 210 accumulation rate. And uh, we compare that to the uh, penetration depth of cesium-137. Analytically, this 25 centimeter analysis uh, is not significantly different from zero. So we are confident that cesium penetrates to at least 18 centimeters uh, in this core. And then we also note that the upper five centimeters of the sediment core are, are mixed rapidly as indicated by thorium-234, which has a half-life of 24 days. And so that rapid mixing causes this constant lead 210 value uh, below which the rapid bioturbation no longer occurs, but we could have slow bioturbation contribute to this uh, 
uh, lead to 10 slope. So what we do is we, we just model the effects. We look at how deep the cesium-137 is in the seabed, and uh, we compare that to the uh, slope of the lead to 10 profile, and that's shown in this figure. So in this column here, we have all the possible uh, combinations of sediment accumulation rate, S, and combinations of dB, all of which produce exactly the same lead to 10 profile. So all of these combinations will uh, give you exactly this same uh, lead to 10 slope. And so we have an infinite number of lead to 10 uh, sediment accumulation rate and uh, dB values that uh, will give us the lead to 10 slope. So we need to use the penetration of cesium-137 to get the uh, uh, resolve the lead to 10 and dB values. And so what this last column shows is that, uh, again, this, these numbers in parentheses show you the six centimeter uh, rapidly mixed bioturbated zone. These are total depths of cesium, predicted total depths of cesium-137 one, cesium penetration. And uh, the point of this figure is, is that if there is bioturbation um, in the seabed, you get a nearly uniform uh, depth of penetration for cesium. It's 18 centimeters essentially for all of these different combinations of sediment accumulation rate, whoops, sediment accumulation rate and uh, bioturbation. Only when the, there is no bioturbation can we, and the penetration of cesium is very shallow, can we say that all of the uh, lead to 10 uh, profile can be attributed to sediment accumulation. So the take home message back in 1985 that uh, myself and Brent McKee and Chuck Nittrauer and others made was that lead 210 and cesium 137 is not very effective in resolving sediment accumulation rate and bioturbation intensity uh, on the uh, in continental shelf environments. All right, enough said. So the next point was to be that I wanted to make was that uh, uh, to look at non uh, major deltaic environments going to the Antarctic shelf. And this was a place where uh, Steve Harden, myself, and uh, Chuck Nittrauer measured lead to 10, but we also measured carbon 14 over the same depth intervals. One core that I'll show you was from Marguerite Bay, another one was from the Bransfield Strait. And so here are the data. Uh, this was the carbon 14 content of the organic fraction. Uh, this is the age in kilo years shown here. And then here is our excess lead to 10 signal uh, in the seabed from those two stations. And so we have lead to 10, naturally occurring lead to 10, uh, and naturally occurring uh, carbon 14. And we can create the following uh, graph to resolve the effects of lead to 10, to resolve the effects of bioturbation and sediment accumulation. So on this graph, we plot sediment accumulation rate versus bioturbation intensity mixing coefficient. And all of the points that satisfy the lead to 10 slope define this line. And all of the points that satisfy the carbon 14 slope fall on that line. And uh, we get uh, a unique intersection of those two lines where the, this data point is consistent with not only the lead to 10 data, but the carbon 14 data. And we did the same thing down in Marguerite Bay. Here's the lead to 10 slope. And here is the uh, carbon 14 uh, slope where they, and they uniquely intersect uh, in case of Marguerite Bay uh, at, at this point. I should point out here that uh, you see the slope of the line for carbon 14 is almost horizontal. And the reason for that is, is because the longer lived radioisotope is much less susceptible 
to the effects of bioturbation than the short-lived one. So you see here the slope of the lead 210 line is very steep. The slope of the carbon 14 line is uh, nearly horizontal. And that's why radiochemists say that you should use the longer lived radioisotope to determine uh, the sediment accumulation rate because it's not susceptible to the effects of bioturbation. So two, not, two steady state tracers measured over the same depth interval can be used to resolve sediment accumulation rates uh, in continental shelf environments. Okay, now having just said that, I'm gonna refute it to some extent. Um, and that is by looking at lead 210 and carbon 14 geochronologies uh, near the mouth of the, the Mekong. And uh, again, this is from that uh, cruises in 2014 and 2015 that Paul Liu and myself and uh, later on, uh, Emily Item and Chuck and I would be uh, measuring uh, radionuclides in these uh, proximal deposits. And so we have, uh, we measured carbon-14 and we measured lead-210 on these uh, proximal cores. And we're, I'm going to compare the geochronology. Now remember, radiochemists, and, and I'm one of them, generally say the longer-lived isotope is the more robust uh, isotope to use in determining shelf sediment uh, geochronologies. Um, I'm going to show you that isn't necessarily true in some systems such as the Mekong. So here is here are lead 210 data. On the left, we have all of the uh, excess lead 210 data uh, shown here in blue. And then on the right, we have the carbon 14 data of the organic matter. Uh, this dotted blue line is what the carbon 14 data should look like if the lead 210 accumulation rates were correct. So here are the C14 ages of the organic matter on, in these casting cores taken from the, taken from the Mekong shelf. And uh, the data are plotted uh, accordingly on the right side of this figure. Uh, another thing that we measure as we measure carbon 14 is this stable isotope content of uh, uh, the organic matter in these deltaic sediments. And uh, that those values are shown in red here on uh, this figure. And I should point out that the Mekong Delta is a mixture. And it's as we found out, it's a varying mixture of terrestrial organic carbon, which is relatively old and has a Delta C13 on the order of minus 30 or minus 31, as compared to younger marine carbon, uh, which is, uh, has a delta C13 of something near minus 25 or minus 26. So what's, what we have to, in order to get an accurate carbon 14 profile, you have to have a constant source of organic carbon and a constant carbon 14 age at the sediment water interface. And we're gonna see that that's not always true because we oscillate back and forth between uh, the organic matter being supplied from land, terrestrial carbon that's older compared to marine car organic carbon that is considerably younger. So here on this first core, we see that uh, there's a lot of scatter in the carbon-14. Uh, it's going from about 1600 years to 2500 years or more, but the slope isn't too bad compared to the lead-210. But look at this second one. Look at KD9. We actually get a negative accumulation rate. 3,000 year old carbon at the surface, 1,000 year old carbon at the uh, bottom of the core. And that's impossible. You can't have a negative <laughs> sediment accumulation rate, as all you marine geologists know. And so uh, uh, this is obviously a non steady state. Uh, supply of carbon-14 and organic matter to the sediment water interface, creating uh, this pseudo decrease or decrease in age and negative sediment accumulation rate. And uh, we see a somewhat similar thing uh, in Casting Core 10. Again, here, look at 
minus 27 at the top of the core going to minus 30 at the bottom of the core, much more terrestrial organic matter. And that's gonna create older organic matter near the bottom of the core. And that's gonna bias the slope of this line and make it much steeper and, uh, uh, or much greater difference in uh, age and give us much slower sediment accumulation rates uh, than normal. So here we have a difference in the lead 210 value 7.9 centimeters per year and an apparent C14 value of 0.3. So, uh, you know, 20, in this case, 100 times different lead 210 accumulation rates compared to uh, uh, the carbon 14. And just to emphasize this point of source a little bit further, uh, here is a plot of organic carbon 14 age versus the delta C13 of that organic carbon. And you can see here that the, all of the marine carbon that's relatively young has a, uh, a relatively positive minus 27 value. And by the time you get down to the terrestrial carbon, more negative delta C13, you're talking about 3000 year old uh, terrestrial organic matter. And the profile that we saw, that, that's exactly these data from Casten Core 9. Um, in Casten Core 9, this is just a mixing profile. These are in red, we have the depths in the core. And uh, so the top of the core, one centimeter was almost all terrestrial, and the bottom of the core was nearly all marine. And it's just a mixing of those two sources. It has nothing to do with age. And so uh, carbon 14 can give you erroneous accumulation rates if you have a non steady state uh, supply of organic matter or a non-steady state age at the uh, sediment water interface uh, in your cores. I have a few more cores to show you just uh, from the Mekong comparing lead 210 and uh, carbon 14. These upper two cores, again, we have a negative, uh, the delta C13 is getting more negative with depth as we go down. And so as we just said, these values for the sediment accumulation rates are, they're too low because they're biased by the terrestrial organic carbon. Where we have lead 210 data and carbon 14 data in these cores, we get pretty good agreement in the carbon 14. Below the depth of lead 210, we uh, have an apparent C14 accumulation rate that is uh, 16 times lower than the lead 210 rate. My point here is that that is probably not true. This low accumulation rate's a function of changing source of organic matter. And the same thing is true in this KC17. Again, good agreement with lead 210 up in the lead 210 region, but then as we get down at depth, we see the uh, delta C13 getting more negative, minus 34, all terrestrial, and we get again the bias uh, in the uh, C14 age uh, from the terrestrial organic matter. Okay, I'm going. I'm on my way to finishing. Stay with me. Um, this third core is uh, just shows you that C14 can agree with lead 210. In this Casten core, we had greater than 10 centimeters per year accumulation rate and the carbon-14 data are consistent with that. Um, in this last core, we had a accumulation rate from lead to 10.5 roughly, uh, good agreement with the C14. It looks like based on the C14 that there's a hiatus in sediment accumulation for several thousand years, but then we get back to a regime where the sediment accumulation rate is pretty similar to what it was with uh, lead to 10. So these bottom two cores, our, the C14 is much, much more believable because of the uh, const, nearly constant delta C13 value and the constant source of organic matter to the sediment water interface. Okay, the very last radiochemical pearl of wisdom, shall we say, um, and that is uh, uh, radionuclides can be used to establish time scales. And this is some pretty uh, 
uh, again, late 20th century uh, uh, research that some of you have forgotten and some of you may have never heard about. And I'm gonna go through it just very quickly. There are radiochemical profiles from the mouth of the uh, Yangtze or Changjiang. And we're gonna compare time scales using thorium-234, 24-day half-life, 100-day time scale, uh, and lead-210 with 22-year half-life and 100-year time scale. So here we have uh, the lead-210 profile, gives us 5.4 centimeters per year, and the uh, thorium-234 profile, if we assume it's all uh, accumulation or deposition, uh, it gives us a value of 4.4 centimeters per month. So a factor of 10 different. Now, the first thing the radiochemists might say is maybe this is all due to bioturbation and it's not an indication of deposition or accumulation. Well, uh, Brent McKee, Chuck Nittrauer and myself measured X-radiographs from this core, very uh, physically stratified, Bioturbation is not a possibility in this core. So uh, the uh, approach is that the thorium-234 profile is 10 times faster in terms of deposition and accumulation compared to the lead-210 profile. So which one is right? The answer is both. They're both right on their characteristic time scale. The thorium-234, which characterizes 100 days since core collection. This core was collected right after a period of high sediment discharge. There was rapid deposition on the order of four centimeters or so per month during the summer season following high sediment discharge. But then during the winter on the Changjiang shelf, we have enormous uh, uh, winter storms that erode 90% of uh, this deposited sediment and it leaves you with a much slower net accumulation rate on the order of five centimeters uh, per year. So again, it's all about time scale and we can measure different time scales by using tracers with different half-lives. So this is just to uh, show you what happens during the winter on the uh, uh, Changjiang shelf. There are strong winter storms resuspending uh, what sediment was rapidly deposited during the, uh, during the summer. And uh, there are also typhoons. This picture on the right shows a uh, Clark Alexander and Ross Elliott and myself walking through uh, high waters following a typhoon. Those typhoons will also resuspend some of that sediment on the Amazon, on the Amazon, on the uh, Changjiang shelf. So in conclusion, you thought I'd never get here. Uh, radionuclides like lead-210 can be useful in assessing uh, rates of offshore to onshore flow as a result of estuarine circulation. Um, the Amazon was very different, having 10 times the onshore flow compared to riverine supply, riverine discharge, as compared to the Mekong, where you didn't have to have any uh, onshore flow to explain the lead-210 uh, inventory in the uh, shelf sediments. With regard to sedimentary determining sedimentary processes on continental shelves, uh, in the early days we used lead 210 and cesium 137 together. That is a not a not a very effective way to resolve sediment accumulation rates and bioturbation uh, intensities uh, in shelf sediments. A much better way is to use carbon 14 and lead 210. Uh, two naturally occurring tracers, but you have to measure them over the same depth interval. And then uh, the uh, last take home message from the sediment accumulation rate story is that uh, in dynamic systems like the Amazon, like the Mekong shelf, we have uh, a non steady state supply of organic matter, which makes carbon 14 based organic matter geochronologies uh, erroneous because of uh, non-steady state conditions. And lead 210 is probably the better, uh, more robust tracer, more steady state nature of its profiles than is the uh, carbon 14. And it hurts me as a radiochemist to say that. And then lastly, 
Uh, tracers are useful in determining different rates, different rates of sedimentary processes on different time scale. And we illustrated that on the Chang Jang uh, shelf, comparing 100 day time scales with the 100 year time scales comparing thorium and lead. So I will end there with a, uh, a shot from the uh, first Amazon shelf study. Um, uh, I don't know if Chuck chimed in or not, uh, but uh, uh, this was the early Amazon studies in the 1980s. Steve, you were there, but you're not in the picture. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, what I'll take questions. I got left out. Oh, thank you, David. This is such a fantastic, fantastic talk. And okay, uh, because okay, some people had to run. Let's let me ask you a question. Uh, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, Dave. Uh, one of the things. Uh, yeah, great talk. And I think Steve is probably the baby uh, or something with the belly being rubbed or kissed, and that's why he's out of the picture. But. Um, one question I wanted to ask regarding the carbon-14, you didn't mention something that I call diagenetic aging, which we've observed on the, um, in the Gulf of Papua for carbon-14. Because of decomposition of the more labile portions of the carbon pool, and you use this yourself in Antarctica quite uh, Oh, yeah. I, that's what I've been uh, doing for the last 10 years. Yes. So, but you didn't mention it in this context. And what we found on the Gulf of Papua uh, clinoform was that the discrepancy in the lead 210 and carbon 14 accumulation rates could be ascribed to uh, the decomposition of the more labile carbon 14 components. And you could show that in the pore waters um, because of the carbon 14 content of the pore waters. You could model what the diagenetic remineralization rates of the carbon-14 pools were and uh, explain that much lower accumulation rate from aging um, by decomposition rather than a variable input at the surface, which is what you uh, are arguing for. So I'm wondering if in fact, in the Mekong, if, it, if your K10 and your K9 sites might be in fact reflecting that process rather than a variable interface process. So if the labile carbon pool were more marine, um, part of the change in the Del 13 uh, value could be also ascribed to remineralization. What do you think about, about that? Sure. Um, first, I think most of that carbon 14 effect, that labile organic carbon that's disappearing, that signal is up in the upper 10 to 20 centimeters. And, uh, and also on the Mekong, I think there's less of that labile carbon that's disappearing. Um, the fact that you get a negative sediment accumulation rate, the younger marine stuff is at the base of the casting core and the older stuff is at the surface, um, it can only be explained by a, a, a non-steady state supply of uh, organic matter to the, to the sediment water interface. Your, your effect is exactly correct. I don't think it's a very large effect on the, uh, in the case of the Amazon, in case the Amazon, in case of the Mekong, um, but it is, it is certainly there. We, we actually have looked for that same effect on the uh, North Carolina continental slope. And you know, we've taken dozen cores from the North Carolina continental slope and looked for the younger labile carbon on the top of casting cores on the continental slope, and you can barely see it. You know, it's like one out of four cores shows a higher carbon-14 uh, signature in the upper five centimeters. So it, yeah. it's relatively small in certain areas. It may be larger in the Gulf of Papua. Um, I don't think it's a huge factor in the Mekong. Well, I, I'm actually not referring to the most labile portions. I'm referring to the slowly decomposing carbon out of the carbon pool that you can you can see it in the poor water DIC. Yeah. Uh, we, so it's, can, it's, it depends can, how you define labile. Yeah, there's, there's not really labile that goes away. And then there's the more labile that takes longer. Yeah, I agree yeah. with you. Uh, and one other thing, I'm sorry, Paul, but uh, I wanted to ask about the assumptions on the Mekong upwelling. Uh, yeah. why, did you, why did you assume that it was uh, 0.1 DPM? 
per liter for that system. I know there's constraints on the Amazon, but but for the upwelling source of uh, dissolved lead 210, why did you assume it was 0.1 dpm per liter? That's just based on the radium. The maximum amount of uh, the, the radium, geosex radium 226 measurements from the uh, from offshore. And okay. if you presume that it's carrying all of its lead 210, then uh, uh, you know you can do that calculation. It could be less, and then that would require more water to come on board on on board the shell. My yeah. only point was you don't need any offshore water to bring uh, to balance the lead 210 budget on the Mekong, and so yeah. that doesn't mean it's not happening. You could have a very a lot of water coming up on the shelf. Um, but with just a very small lead 210 signature, you could have that shelf occur. You just don't need it to explain the lead 210 budget like you did on the Amazon. On the Amazon, 85% of the lead 210 came from offshore water. So it was a really clear story there. Okay, yeah. we, we, we had to move on, sorry, and, um, because there's many people, Tom and Steve there. Um, so actually, uh, Dave, you know, uh, Mekong is uh, the mud only deposit with uh, 15 to 20 meters. It's a very, very uh, limited offshore water supply because so narrow, so shallow compared to Amazon. We should write a review paper, compare this two system, you know, about this. Okay, Tom. Tom, we have a question? Uh, no, I didn't have one, I'm sorry. Oh, I just saw you unmute yourself. Okay, anybody else? Any comments, any yes. questions? I, I have a question, Dave. So um, great, great talk. I really enjoyed that sort of tour of, of the Amazon, especially, and also the comparison with the Mekong. Um, Back to the so, days of yesteryear. <laughs> so quick, quick comment and then a qu couple, maybe a, a question. The one is about the cesium going away you mentioned earlier. It really surprises me more people aren't using plutonium isotopes these days, especially since we can measure it relatively easily now by ICPMS, but that's that's another chapter. My, my question is, um, when you look at the inventories on the Amazon shelf and you're calculating your flux based on steady state assumptions, how does the mobile surface mixed layer play into that? Because I see a lot of that stuff is just fluxing through in the upper uh, one to 1.5 meters of that mixed layer. And that, who knows, that might be changed seasonally. And, and would, might that have an effect on that, uh, that flux calculation? Yeah, it's, it certainly would. That's, that's a good question. Um, in general, most of those inventories, as you well know, um, we didn't, there's a meter of uh, fluid mud maybe on top of some of those cores, but by the time we got them on, on board <laughs> ship, yeah. uh, we didn't have a meter of fluid mud anymore. So right. essentially those inventories are the inventories of the sediment we got on board ship and could sample. It's a so function. we probably undersampled the, uh, 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 the fluid mud on the Amazon shelf. Mm. There may be more of it there, but you really shouldn't count it. You're right. If it's being transported uh, off the shelf uh, on long time scales, yearly to 100 year time scales, you shouldn't count it as a, uh, a trap. You should really just count the, uh, the steady state long term accumulation on the shelf in your budget. So uh, your point is well made, but we, we really didn't sample the fluid muds really well. Yeah, that's that's something I've been thinking about for um, another system that we're working on the Arawati since it's just yeah. it, it appears uh, to it, be I, I wouldn't count the fluid muds in the budget. Uh, they're they're just transient. Yep. Okay. And I guess the, really the question becomes how do you is the surface mixed layer also transient and how, how do you factor that in? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, anyway. you can have a surface mix layer be steady state. Yeah, you can. It doesn't have to be, <laughs> but it can be. <laughs> All right, I'll pass it on to someone else. Thanks a lot, Dave. Sure, great thanks, Dave. Talk. That's so great. Um, anybody else? But if no, that's so great. I think 
Dave, thank you for such a great talk and uh, it's a, such a feast. And we have a, such a joyful heart this morning with the great news and with your talk. And uh, I'm very, I'm very happy. And so uh, um, once again, next week, we have two more talk. Uh, you are just talk about Yerawadi uh, and the sediment suspended load discharge. And also some battery talk about the Mississippi River. Finally, we come back, come here, come back home, talk about Mississippi River, source to sink. Okay. Uh, I think we can stop here, have a good day and uh, enjoy. And uh, one more, this will be on the YouTube. So, uh, you know, you can go back to rewatch it. Okay, bye-bye. Paul, Paul, I'd also like to make the slides available to anybody that wants them. Oh, definitely. Also, uh, uh, Bob, if you're still around, people asking me about your, your PowerPoint, as I mentioned last time, please try your best to make it available, okay? And so that will be very, very useful, Dave. Thank you, because uh, um, many young generations, they, they need to understand uh, what's going on, you know, how to use this tool to help us answer that fluid dynamic and sedimentary process. Okay, that would be very, very useful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for tuning in. So enjoy, maybe we should get somewhere to 